When you think of the most impressive assets in the US military arsenal, stealth bombers, destroyers and tanks are probably what first comes to mind. But now, we might just radically shift your perspective. New attack submarines are being built for the US military, in particular the Virginia class Block 5 submarines, which are not only powerful but have nuclear attack capabilities. The first Virginia-class submarines were first planned in 1991 as a cost-effective replacement to the Seawolf class of submarines, which cost around $1 billion more per unit. While development was slow at first due to a number of technological obstacles, the first wave or block of Virginia-class submarines was commissioned between 2004 and 2008. Since then, a new block has been commissioned every four to six years, with the first Block 4 submarine entering service in April of 2020. So what really makes these submarines so impressive? An analysis of the first Block 4 submarine, the USS Vermont, says it all. It's the third naval vessel to be named after the Green Mountain State. The first Vermont was a 74-gun warship authorized by Congress way back in 1816, and the second Vermont was a battleship number 20, commissioned in 1907. The new USS Vermont is the first of 10 planned Virginia-class Block 4 submarines and is 377 feet long, has a 34-foot beam, and can dive to depths greater than 800 feet, although its maximum depth is classified. When submerged, it can operate at speeds in excess of 25 knots and has a displacement of 7,800 tons, fully loaded with a 132-person crew. Additionally, like every Virginia-class submarine before it, it's powered by an advanced nuclear reactor. While these physical metrics don't make it the largest or fastest submarine in the world, it's by far the world's most technologically advanced nuclear attack submarine. This is due to its impressive onboard devices. For example, the submarine uses a unified modular mast rather than a collection of several masts. This is highly useful because a unified mast acts as an all-in-one tool for sensing the sub's surroundings, navigating water bodies, communicating with home base, and detecting enemy communications and radar. It also has an advanced pump jet propulsor, which is superior to a traditional blade propeller because it reduces the risk of caviation and is significantly quieter. These two features are topped off by an electronic ship control system, an advanced command and control system module, a strong auxiliary generator, a modernized integrated combat system to improve the sub's warfare capabilities, an advanced electromagnetic silencing system to detect magnetic mines, and a nine-man lockout chamber that acts as a small, detachable submarine. To increase its enemy detection and communication abilities, it also has an impressive sonar system. The first component of the system is the Large Aperture Bow Sonar Array, which provides enhanced passive detection capabilities. The second is a Wide Aperture Lightweight Fiber Optic Sonar Array, which provides sonar sensor input to the submarine's combat system. The third is a pair of high-frequency active sonars mounted in the sail and bow, which enables safer operation in coastal waters, enhances under-ice navigation, and improves anti-submarine warfare performance. The fourth component is a low-cost conformal array high-frequency sonar, which provides high-frequency coverage above and behind the submarine. The final components are a TB-34 Fatline Tactical Toad Sonar Array and a TB-33 Thinline Long Range Search Toad Sonar Array, both of which act as acoustic sensors to give the submarine ears in the area surrounding it. In short, this rather complicated sonar system is so effective that it can reportedly detect enemy ships that are as far as 3,000 miles away. Yet, all of this technology doesn't even include the sub's heavy-hitting armaments, which consists of several Tomahawk cruise missiles and a number of Mark 48 advanced capability torpedoes. These torpedoes can be launched from one of four torpedo launch systems, and the missiles from either one of 12 vertical launch systems or one of two Virginia payload tubes. Interestingly, the Virginia payload tubes in particular will likely be equipped with global strike missiles, 
consisting of a common hypersonic glide body and a 34.5-inch two-stage booster. The Navy claims that these missiles can hit any target in the world in the span of just one hour. If this is to be believed, this would mean that the missiles can travel in the Mach 10 to Mach 20 range, which equates to a speed of 7,600 to 15,200 miles per hour. This will potentially make the USS Vermont a massive game changer in future conflicts. But the impressive submarines come at a price. The new Block 4s that are equipped with the Virginia payload module cost a hefty $3.4 billion per unit, and the future Block 5s are projected to cost about $2.45 billion per unit. With the Virginia payload module being a large factor in this high price, the reason why it's so expensive is due to its sheer size and capability. Coming in at 84 feet and built into the hull, this massive module is comprised of four payload tubes that can store as many as 28 Tomahawk cruise missiles, adding up to a grand total of 40 cruise missiles when including the sub's bow tubes. A massive upgrade to the submarine's firepower, these modules are to make Virginia-class submarines an effective replacement to the SSGN-guided missile subs, which are slated to enter retirement. Thus, the importance of the Block 5 submarines and their Virginia payload modules cannot be understated. And, as put by Rear Admiral David Goggins, a generational leap in submarine capability for the Navy, these design changes will enable the fleet to maintain our nation's undersea dominance. However, these costs may soon be justified. This is because the US Navy has big plans for the Virginia-class submarines. This is because, unlike their predecessors, they will not only be powered by nuclear energy, but will use nuclear energy in their weapons. Now, that's not to say other submarines before the Block 4s have not used nuclear weapons. For example, the US government admitted to test launching one to two low-yield nuclear warheads from an Ohio-class submarine, the USS Tennessee, in 2018. Additionally, attaching nuclear weapons to seaborne vessels, be it a ship or submarine, is nothing new. In fact, about 22% of the United States nuclear arsenal is currently at sea. However, it is US policy to neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons abroad. But the US plans for Block 4 go far beyond simple nuclear missiles. This is because, while it's likely that nuclear missiles will be on board future submarines, what is more impressive is that the Navy plans on attaching nuclear-powered lasers to them. While this may sound like something out of a Star Wars movie, at first we were even surprised, because typically lasers don't work well underwater. However, these lasers, which are to be about 300 to 500 kilowatts in strength, will come from a nuclear reactor that generates about 30 megawatts of power. And with this high-energy laser being mounted onto the unified mast system, the submarine's power store is not only more than sufficient, but strong enough to ensure that the laser's beam won't dissipate underwater. This high-energy laser is effective because it's a useful replacement for torpedoes or missiles when fighting against swarms of smaller targets, such as a group of enemy drones, speedboats, or anti-submarine helicopters. This laser weapon would give the submarine a big advantage in situations where missiles or torpedoes would be ineffective. With all this going on, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that many countries outside of NATO have not been too fond of the nuclear test launches and weapon developments within the United States submarine programs. Russia has been the most outspoken critic of the program, yet even members of Congress were split over the issue. However, just like with any political clash, there are two sides to the story. The crux of the United States' argument for low-yield nuclear weapons has lied on their use as a defense mechanism. For example, John Rood, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, said the deployment of low-yield nuclear warheads lowers the risk of nuclear war by helping dissuade Russia from initiating a limited nuclear conflict. This sentiment is echoed by General Hyten of the US Army, who stated that the adversaries of the United States believe the deployment of a low-yield nuclear weapon would not be responded to by NATO or the United States. Therefore, he believes that the first role of that weapon would be to act as a deterrent. Now, this makes sense to a point. 
After all, American adversaries such as Russia and China are known to have a stockpile of low-yield nuclear weapons. Therefore, if the US or one of its allies were to be attacked by one, it would be appropriate for the US to have a stock of them in order to appropriately respond. However, in the same meeting, General Hightum was asked whether the US would have targets in mind for these weapons, and General Hightum responded that, I'll just say for the record that, yes, there is. This is concerning because it exposes the willingness of the United States to use those weapons not just defensively, but perhaps offensively. Additionally, Moscow has repeatedly rejected US allegations that Russia was considering a nuclear conflict. After all, Russia has argued that a limited nuclear conflict would inevitably escalate into a full-blown nuclear war. Therefore, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov has called it very alarming that the US views a low-intensity nuclear conflict as a feasible option. As a final note, it should be recognized that US President Donald Trump pulled out of the INF with Russia in 2019, and the Russians are not hopeful that the US will extend the New START Treaty, which is set to expire in 2021. Considering that this is the last remaining arms control deal between Russia and the US, it's not hard to see why Russia is concerned. Yet, whether the rest of the world likes it or not, Congress approved the development of several low-yield nuclear warheads for submarine-launched ballistic missiles in late 2018. However, the question still remains, is the USA looking to start a nuclear war? Or is the country just trying to defend against Russian aggression? While the answer to that certainly isn't clear as of now, all we can really do is wait and see. We welcome your comments. Stay informed on scientific and military events by subscribing and turning on notifications. Thanks for watching.